Galatians 3, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 19. Galatians 3, and let's begin there at verse 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promises, excuse me, the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one. That is, a mediator negotiates between two uh, contentious parties. But God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For, there, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterward be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. The Mosaic Law, the Ten Commandments, were given to men and to women to show them how bad they really were and how badly they needed God's help. Uh, it was to prepare the world to receive Jesus Christ one day. But uh, Jeremiah w would write, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17, verse 9. And Christ would point out, For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Matthew 12, 34. The Apostle Paul wrote, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Romans 12, verse 3. But men are slow learners. They want to believe that if God simply told them what they were to do and how they were supposed to live, then they could handle the rest of it on their own. They could set about to do it, to fulfill those things, and thus earn God's approval and get into heaven. They told Moses, it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Deuteronomy 6, verse 25. But if you recall, God gave Adam and Eve one rule in the Garden of Eden, and they couldn't keep that one. They lived in paradise, I idyllic circumstances, but uh, still failed. Jesus, or rather, the Jews told Moses, all that the Lord hath said will we do and be obedient. Exodus 24, verse 7. But they weren't. God had arranged it in just such a way that they would actually condemn themselves if they kept all of the law. Uh, the fourth commandment, Exodus 20, verses 8, 9, and 10. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. However, the Lord told them that every male baby was to be circumcised at eight days old, Genesis 17 and Leviticus chapter 12. But if the eighth day happened to fall upon a Sabbath, the day of rest, they would have to violate one commandment in order to keep another. And the Lord Jesus subtly pointed out to them this contradiction in John chapter 7, verses uh, 23 and 20, or 22 and 23. And he asked them, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, who isn't going to pull his oxen or his ass out of a pit if it falls into it on a Sabbath day? In uh, John chapter, or Luke chapter 14. And uh, that's labor in itself. You're going to work up a sweat trying to get a, a, a jackass or an oxen 
out of a big hole or a pit. Uh, and if the and the, if the mule is stubborn, it's going to be even more work. There's no getting around it. That's a that's an effort of labor. And if the thing doesn't want to budge, it's going to be work. But the ultimate purpose of God's commandments was to help men see how holy God is and how unholy they are or they were by contrast. Verse 24 says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, or rather to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. And I call this sermon, I'm going back about five or six years. It's been at least that long since I preached this, maybe longer. I call this sermon Five Damnable Heresies. They're all found in our text today in the next five verses. So let's just go ahead and, and mention them and then try to answer them. And number one is in verse 25, but after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. And we would agree with that. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law, Romans 3, 28. But the first heresy is this. And I'll try to summarize these if you're taking notes uh, so you can make proper headings. Since I'm saved by grace through faith and kept saved by God's grace, it doesn't matter how I live from this point on. I don't need to worry about Old Testament commandments. My life is my own. I can do whatever I want to do. You know, there are some fine believers and some very sweet and sincere Christians in Pentecostal churches. I've known them and know them even today. And they've been friends of mine over my lifetime growing up. But there are many Pentecostal preachers who tell their church members that this is what we preach. Since I'm saved by grace through faith, it doesn't matter what I do now. I had a Pentecostal preacher tell me that. I was working with him. And you know, when you're in a company with 200, 300 employees, you're kind of desperate for fellowship. You find somebody who says they love the Lord and they have some acquaintance with Scripture and uh, you can kind of discern that they're saved. You're, you, you hope to find some fellowship with them. And we'd go out and get a soda together at break time and so forth. And he actually told me out of the blue, well, you Baptists, you believe once saved, always saved. That means you can go out and do whatever you want to do and live however, however you want to live. It doesn't matter. And I said, you know, as a preacher's kid growing up, I've heard a lot of different preachers speak. Been to other churches and heard them preach. And I have never once heard one Baptist preacher in my life say such a thing. There may be some Christians who live that way, even if they wouldn't phrase it or define it like I did, but we call those people carnal Christians. We call them worldly Christians. We call them rebellious and disobedient Christians. We preach, for ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's, 1 Corinthians 6, 20. They both belong to him now. We preach, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness, 1 Thessalonians 4, 7. We preach, be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap, Galatians 6, 7. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting, Galatians 6, 8. And I hesitated, I thought about not saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway. We mention, uh, we might mention, that the four-square Pentecostal denomination was founded by a flamboyant, flashy, uh, wannabe actress named Amy Simple McPherson. She was first widowed, and then she remarried and was divorced. Her husband left her because he couldn't stand living under in her shadow. The news media was clamoring around her. This is back in the 1920s. And she dressed like a celebrity, dressed like a movie star. Her church was out here in Southern California called Angelus Temple in uh, Los Angeles. And uh, she would put on theatrical plays. She would ask her people to build sets and people to make costumes for her so she could dramatize her sermons like a, like a stage play. And the reporters and the news media, they loved it. And of course, she loved the uh, accolades and the attention she was getting and fame all over the country. Everybody wanted to 
see Ms. McPherson preach. Uh, she was carried up onto the stage in a casket and then they popped open and she stood up and preached her sermon from the inside of a casket one time. But this is how uh, flashy and flamboyant uh, this woman was. She and her secretary went to a, uh, uh, you know, a house, a house apartment on the beach in Venice, California. And so, so ostensibly to write a sermon and, you know, enjoy the water for a while. Well, they didn't have a lot of telephones in the 19, that's about 1926. And, I, and so the secretary had to go down the road to make a phone call. When she returned, Ms. McPherson was gone. And uh, they thought, well, maybe she went swimming and drowned out there. So they organized a search party. One person actually drowned uh, in the course of searching for this woman. And a month went by, people, was, the newspapers ran big, bold headlines, McPherson dead. It's thought by, by people that she was dead. And uh, a month later, she turns up uh, near the Arizona and Mexico border. She was shacking up with some guy for a month. And when she saw the news headlines and what was being said about her nationwide, she said, I better come out of hiding. And so she emerged and claimed she had been kidnapped and uh, held by three, she, she miraculously escaped from them, and uh, that this was the story that she put out. But it was pretty, because the, one of her sound engineers, she was one of the early, I guess you would call her a pioneer in, in broadcasting, radio broadcast of her sermons, one of the early sound engineers uh, also was missing for a month. So they, people have investigated and pieced it together. One fellow said, I'm 99% sure she was simply having an affair. Oral Roberts, Benny Hinn, Catherine Kuhlman, Joyce Meyer, Jesse Duplantis, Kenneth Copeland, that floozy Jan Crouch, that homo Paul Crouch, Jimmy Swagger, Jim and Tammy Baker, all of those people come from the Pentecostal background. Let's not say the pot's calling the kettle black, but be careful what you say. We believe whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth, Hebrews 12 tells us. And what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be uh, sons, then God chaste, dealeth, with, dealeth with you as with sons. It's a heresy to think that you're free to live however you want to live. A true believer is supposed to be an ambassador for Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.20. And uh, if you're free to live however you want to live and have, don't have to regard the admonitions, the commandments of Scripture, are you saying that it's okay now to commit adultery? Is it okay now to um, bear false witness against you? Is it okay now to worship idols? Is it okay now to commit murder? Let's move on. Number two, verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. This is why we all come from different backgrounds and we live in different circumstances. We're different ages, different ethnicities, but we enjoy being with one another because we've all been born again by trusting in the same blood of Jesus Christ. That's what makes me want to come here and be with you and hopefully you with me Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. We're all children of God because we've all been born again by him. The second heresy taken from the first part of this verse is, we're all God's children, even without Christ. If God loves us, he wouldn't damn anyone to hell, would he? The Catholic Church teaches that if you're a Protestant, a Jew, a Muslim, a Buddhist, a Hindu, or even an atheist, but you want to do good, you want to live a, a good life, that that constitutes what they call the baptism of desire. And therefore, God will accept you and take you into heaven, even if you never join the Catholic Church. The God's standard of getting to heaven has nothing to do with your goodness or with what church you belong to or don't belong to. His standard is Jesus. We, we preached about this last Sunday, God's righteous salvation. His standard is Jesus Christ. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Every word in that verse is a single syllable. 
he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. I don't know how God could have made it any simpler. But you don't get to heaven, and you're not considered God's child until you've been born again by his seed. Being born again not of corruptible seed, but being born again uh, uh, incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Let's move on. Number three, verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. The third heresy, which is wrenched from this verse, is that water baptism saves a sinner. Every group that teaches water baptism, water baptism has something to do with your salvation, whether they be Catholic, Lutheran, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, United Methodist, Congregationalist, Mormons, or Jehovah's Witnesses, all use the same scriptures, they interpret them the same way to, to arrive at the same conclusion. But only in our church, right? All those other guys, they're wrong, but we're right. Or the Church of Christ or anybody else. Somehow, the same feeble interpretation of scripture is only uh, true when we preach it, but not when they preach it. Water baptism has never saved one soul from going to hell. Never. Water baptism, and I mentioned this last week, cannot wash away the sin in your heart. Water baptism doesn't make you a Christian, it makes you wet. That's about all you can say about it. It makes you wet. And where do you see the word water anywhere in that verse anyway? 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13 says, For by, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. It's the work of the Holy Spirit that puts you into the body of Jesus Christ, into the church at your conversion. And you're baptized thus by him. Water has nothing to do with it at all. Remember the thief on the cross next to the Lord Jesus? Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He hanging there in it, being murdered like the other like Christ was he yells to the other thief on the other side of Christ this man hath done nothing nothing amiss but we uh, are receiving the just reward for our deeds and he was never baptized but he repented the change has to occur on the inside that's where it must begin number four verse 28 there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. This is the heresy of total integration. Everyone is equal to everyone else. Race doesn't exist, ethnicity doesn't, gender doesn't exist, social status or social position that doesn't exist. These ideas are not society's problems. These are people's mental problems that have become society's problems. And you and I are seeing it on full display everywhere we look these days. There are no more men's and women's restrooms, you know. I went, there's a, a men's suit clothing store that I've gone to and uh, they took the signs off the doors, and now it's just some sort of symbol. You know, anyone, go ahead. You know, whichever bathroom is available first, uh, go ahead and use it. But uh, men and women are different. And thank the Lord for that. Men, hopefully, God willing, we exhibit and show forth certain manly qualities that appeal to women that want to or our wives or to women that might become our wives and uh they see there's something distinct about him i'm drawn to that man and ladies women god made you in such a way that a man can't help looking at you i thank the lord for that the idea that you know I don't want you calling me a Mr. or a Ms. or a Ms. or anything else, whatever gender pronoun uh, they want to be called by. Forget that. 
a whatchamacallit or a thingamajig or a doohickey or a thingamabob or a zigzag, or whatever term you want to call yourself, um, I'm not going to waste my time on my brain cells trying to figure out what you think you are today. You're either a male or a female. But um, there, like, there's no more racial identity, no more racial distinction to be made. Listen, I like you Koreans, but I'm not like you. You understand the distinction, the difference? I love you, but I'm not like you. Your family's histories and background and history of your nation and country, totally different than mine. And thank the Lord for those differences. You know, in a marriage ceremony, many times the, the minister will say, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Well, what if we flip that around? God divided Noah's sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, sent them off in three different directions to repopulate the world. What God hath divided, let no man join together. Or let man be cautious about joining them together. I'm not going to force my white skin into like a black congregation. Let them worship among their own people the way they want to worship. Salvation doesn't depend upon your emotionalism or your lack of it or whatever you do, it depends on whether you know Jesus Christ. And um, if they want to come to our church, fine. If they're a Bible believer, we're going to preach what we believe is the truth from the scriptures. Accepting it and believing it's going to be between them and God. And likewise, I'm not going to go to an all Korean church and insist that they interpret everything in English for me. Why? Why should I? And why should they? So I I like you, but I'm not like you. God made certain distinctions, and those distinctions don't disappear. You know, when I was a six-year-old boy, I came forward here and bowed my head and asked God to save me and closed my eyes and prayed. And when I opened my eyes, my dad was still my dad. My mom was still my mom. The Mexican people were still Mexican people. White people were still white people. Those things didn't change. And I didn't change. I looked in the mirror. I looked the same as I did the day before. But if all people are, are to be treated alike without any distinction, then I'll tell you what. I want to be able to park in the handicap spot when I go to the mall. Save a few steps. Why should they, they get special treatment, right? If I'm driving by myself, I want to be able to use the carpool lane. I've got three imaginary friends riding with me, so why shouldn't we? Why shouldn't I? I had a buddy that couldn't make it, but he said, I'll be with you in spirit. So he, actually, he's riding with me too. Why should some people get special treatment? Because they, you know, pack their car with more than one driver. This, this country is insane. You know what? This state is insane. The politicians are idiots. They have no idea what they're doing. Maybe they do know what they're doing, and they're just taking the whole state and the nation downhill. The truth is, Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Acts 10.34. That's regarding salvation. And, uh, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Acts 10.35. To him, that's Christ, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Acts 10.43. We're made equal only by trusting in the same shed blood of Jesus Christ and only by being born again. The, the, the um, equality among men, women, races, economic, social, status, bond, free, and so forth are all spiritual by trusting in Jesus Christ. Let's move on to the last point. Number five, verse 29. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The fifth heresy should be obvious, and that is this. That God is finished with the Jews. The, promise to, the promises to bless the nation of Israel are somehow now transferred to the church of Jesus Christ, most of whom are Gentiles. This is what's called replacement theology in modern parlance. 
they use verses like this one to try and prove their point. But you need to go back to the book of Romans, chapters 2 and 3 and 4, maybe 5, and see what Paul says about Jews and Gentiles. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, those would be Jews, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, Romans 4, 16. Paul wrote those words to Gentiles in Rome. As if you can show forth the same kind of faith to God that Abraham showed, trusting God's words and God's promises without being able to understand it all, but just accept what God said as true, then you are accepted by God and you are counted a spiritual seed of Abraham. Uh, Gentiles could believe in the God as simply as Abraham did, and many Jews could not. The Apostle Paul had no, test, no New Testament to read in his day. He was busy writing most of it. So when he asked in Romans chapter 11, verse 1, Hath God cast away his people? He was talking about Jews. He was referring to Jews, Old Testament Israelites. God told Moses, Exodus 3, verse 10, Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Paul answers his own question, has God cast away his people? God forbid. There in Romans 11, verse 1. Most of the Jews rejected Christ, but some did believe. Paul refers to these as the election or the election of grace. And later, Romans 11, verses 5 and 7. Then he says that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Romans 11, verse 25. So when the church, which comprises Jews and Gentiles, disappears in the rapture, then God will return his attention to the nation of Israel in their worst time of trial, the Great Tribulation. Now, there's a, there's a perverse, malicious, hate-filled anti-Semite at a church in Arizona I hate to use his name in our video, but I think most everybody watching our videos knows who I'm referring to. His name is Stephen Anderson, and he's the pastor of a, a supposed independent Baptist church. You know what this guy did? He weaseled his way into rabbis' homes and Jewish uh, officials' homes so that he could interview them about a movie he was doing on the history of the Jews, set up his camera, interview them in their own living rooms, and then he took their, their uh, interviews and put them together in a very anti-Semitic film, uh, testifying that God is finished with the Jew. And all of God's interest is now on the church. The church has replaced the Jew. He calls himself an independent King James Baptist. He's an anti-Semite, and he needs to be exposed as one. So he preaches that the church will go through the tribulation, because to say that we believe in a a pre-trib rapture, that means that gives undue attention to the Jew during the tribulation, and in his mind, uh, God is all finished with the Jew. So he says the church goes through the tribulation and is raptured after the tribulation. You know, there's a basic problem with that. If the church is here during the tribulation, then it's not the tribulation. It's effectively still the church age. How many bozo couldn't see that? You know, the word obvious literally means standing in the way. You get trip over it if you're not careful. That's how clear the truth ought to be. But God is not finished with the Jewish people. The church does not replace the Jews or the nation of Israel. All of these heresies ignore the most important uh, qualifying element. They're in verses 25 through 29. But after that faith has come, verse 25... By faith in Christ Jesus, verse 26, have put on Christ, verse 27, one in Christ Jesus, verse 28, and if ye be Christ, verse 29. I'm going to close right here. Without Jesus Christ, the world grasps for something to believe in, some philosophy, some idea, some practice they think will uh, satisfy them, them and give their life meaning and even get them to heaven one day. 
and give them hope. But there is no hope without Jesus Christ. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. 1 Thessalonians 1.3 1 Timothy 1.1 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope.